Okay, so now to the final principle, principle eight. And this is again on reasonable adjustments and it's the final letter, the letter H. And the H stands for help. I know I've touched on it in other ones. The importance of getting that help to overcome those barriers is absolutely critical. So when we look at anything relating to healthcare, the way we have to look as health professionals is what would I achieve if there weren't the barriers caused by this person's additional needs, whether it's a learning disability, whether it's mental health, whether it's autism, whatever the barriers are, what would I achieve if those barriers weren't there? And how am I going to try and achieve that? Now, it's not always possible to overcome those barriers, but it is possible to ensure you have really dotted the I's and cross the T's and covered everything to get there and that is using the mental capacity principles so you do need to always weigh up does this person have capacity to understand the risks of not proceeding with what I want to proceed with for them the health care I want to offer them do they understand the risks of that if they don't understand the risks and they're only rejecting the act you're going to do, the actual things you're going to do to them, then they do not have capacity to make that as an informed decision. Then you have to go to best interest, which is enlisting the help of the people who know them well to work with you on your clinical judgment. So if you clinically believe it's in their best interest to have this health treatment, then it's around working with the other people to say it is in their best interest, me clinically, I believe so. So how can we achieve that in a least restrictive way? Now, that is where you need to really work together to try and come up with those alternative outside the box ways, as Gavin says, to achieving that. And you have to think in terms of Harry Potter and in terms of the nurse who spoke to Gavin about your blood tests. Mm -hmm. And you need to think about Sockman. You know, it's about how do we get to that situation? Now, let's take an example. So, for example, a lady who is refusing breast screening. Now, if in that discussion, all the people who know her well can only conclude that the absolutely only way you're going to get her to have a breast screening is through a general anaesthetic, then the balance of scales is tipped. The chances are that the risk of her being under general anaesthetic is greater than the risk of her not having the breast screening. However, if she has a very strong family history of breast cancer or she's symptomatic, then the balance may start tilting the other way. So that's why every decision needs to be really thoroughly worked through. Try to find alternatives like Harry Potter and document fully and thoroughly every step that's been taken to try and overcome that barrier to achieve that using all the help you can get. Now, that's the background to it. So let's whiz through all the ways of additional things you can do to get that help when you hit those barriers. Now, all the way through, we've talked about reasonable adjustments and accessible information standard and knowing the person and getting that background information. In Hertfordshire, we have the purple folder. Yep. Other counties have other health passports. This yeah. is our health passport, isn't yeah. it? Now, critical, page one should have a photo of the person. Don't go for preconceptions, isn't it? Because so often, a bit like you in hospital, yeah. people assumed that how you were presenting was who you were. Yeah. Now, if they had seen a picture of you on your best day here, they wouldn't have assumed that that was your learning disability. No. So, again, that helps people see who this person is when they're well. And often people with learning disability taken into hospital, you know, and they're not communicating, and there is an assumption that that non-communicative person is their learning disability and not who they are. Yeah. So that's really key. Um, what else do you think in here, Gavin? The, is... That important page where you're not free, signs of being unwell or in pain. That's yeah. a really important page because you can write down there exactly how you are. So for me, I could write down in there, you know, I get very worried, overwhelmed, start crying and sometimes might come across a bit irritable. 
when I'm not feeling well. And that, that's something I could put on there, yeah. which I could show. So then they can know then that that is your signs of pain or unwellness. Yeah. And yet this is what you look like and behave like and communicate like when you're well. Yeah. So it's a really clear way of being able to, if a health professional's not listening, to be able to say, no, look, no, look, this is what it is so as a health yeah. professional it's really key to open this mm. and learn that information yeah. ideally you know get that information before you're really having encounters with them yeah um and then we've got there's lots of other important information but i'm going to skip through to the yellow pages so this we've talked about before as the um um jigsaw puzzle of yeah. health and getting all the help you can get now often the jigsaw puzzle is about where they've been before and if you don't tell the doctor other health professionals you're seeing and your carer or your wife doesn't tell the doctor other health professionals you're seeing that doesn't help them build that jigsaw puzzle of diagnosis mm. so this is every health professional should just put a couple of words to say who you are and what you've seen them for so that anyone later visiting or seeing this person can build that health picture up and that really helped me once when um when i went to a dentist and the dentist had written in there how nervous i can get um going and that i get nervous about needles and things and then i had to go for a scan now in the scan i had there was a needle had to be involved and the nurse had saw in that bit that i get scared of needles so yeah. she said to me okay you need to have this needle but what can we do to make it better and we made a reasonable adjustment for it so excellent yeah. but she only saw that because and i forgot to mention it to her because i was nervous and she saw that because she read of what the dentist had put Excellent. And then we've, I mean, for delays in diagnosis, another guy, do you remember me telling the story of the chap um, who started having falls? Yes. And, so GP, imagine he's got his empty jigsaw piece here. The man's having some falls. He's disengaged. He'd stopped watching telly. He'd stopped looking at his books. He was sleeping more. He'd got Down syndrome and he was approaching 40. Now, mm. the health professional made the diagnosis that it was early onset dementia because it's common in people with Down syndrome and all the signs were possible signs of dementia. But when he got to see the neurologist, the neurologist read back and said, was it a sudden onset? Was it a gradual onset? All these changes. And they worked out it was a sort of fairly sudden onset in February. And when he looked back and saw February, he said, so he went to the opticians in February. And what happened then? They went, Oh, he got new glasses. And he poor bloke couldn't see a thing out of these glasses. So he was walking around in glasses he couldn't see. He was having falls. He was losing interest in the telly. He was no longer um, looking at his books. He was sleeping more. Mm. The poor man was trying to see through a pair of glasses that he couldn't see anything through. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, that's how key the purple folder is in getting that information and understanding, you know, how to work with someone. We also have a new one. This is the purple card, and this is for people, sort of yeah. your ability, isn't it? Yeah. And this is a snapshot of what reasonable adjustments I need and the key, my key health conditions. Yeah. And then key contacts. So I've got on mine about um, needle, you know, needlephobia, needlephobia yeah. and how I need reasonable adjustments for that. And I've also got that I have blood thinners. Fab. Yeah. So yeah. that's really critical. And again, it helps health professionals to instantly know. So you know, that this person is on the GP's Learning Disability Register and does need reasonable adjustments. Yep. So we've got those two. We've talked a lot about the expertise, like we say, of filling that jigsaw puzzle, the expertise mm -hmm. of whether they're next door neighbour, paid carer, wife, family. Yeah. All that information helps you as them as a health professional to build that story up. We've also started making something called Me On My Best Day, haven't we? We're encouraging people to do. Yes. And that's getting people to make a 15-second video of what they look like, behave like, and do on their best day. Yeah. And so it's... And we can, we can insert an example of that into this film so, you know, the health professionals can see that and ask for it. It's worth, as a health professional, asking to see it because it will just give you that snapshot of who the person is. I'm working in journalists in my 10 years in journalists. Uh, I get the uh, work good work. I shut up, I stay with my mum, I go book there, book journalists. Or sometimes I get the bus 
if if no 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 spare bar, I get a taxi to to work. Why do you like your work? Because I've got lots of friends there. So the next is about learning disability nurses and the community learning disability nurses and how they can help with healthcare. Yeah. Um. So. I think it's really important for health professionals to know what the community nurse's role is because it's not about us as nurses taking over and doing tasks for a health care service. It's about us working with them to overcome the barriers. So I always see it as our role is to bridge the gap, mm. not to fill it. You know, so that if once a health professional has made an assessment that they need to do something and it's in the person's best interest... If they can't come up with the least restrictive way of achieving it, then it's worth asking us to see if there's anything more we could add or anything else we could do to help them overcome the barriers. Yeah. So the example I've got is um, very recently, one of our community nurses, it was somebody for the um, COVID vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, and no, it wasn't. It was a blood test. It was actually a blood test. Absolutely essential blood test. And everyone was struggling and they were saying the only way was under GA. Now, she made a cardboard box with Minions on it because Minions was his favourite character and made a hole in it mm -hmm. for him to put his arm through for the blood test to be taken. And then, first of all, she um, went through the process and showed them what was going to happen on her and then did this and did all these distractions and made a certificate ready for when it was finished and it, well, what a big achievement it's going to be. And they so put his arm through, accepted it, and then did a big award ceremony at the GP surgery <laughs> with a certificate and everyone taking pictures of the award. Brilliant. And absolutely loved it. The pride on this person's face for finally achieving this blood test. Now, it was the nurse who did it, the practice nurse who did it. You know, it wasn't our nurse who took over. She just came up with these other ideas, did some work jointly with the practice nurse and the service user to come up with an alternative way to overcome that barrier. And that's how we fit in. So that's the learned disability nurses. Um, and obviously the same the acute nurses that you worked with in the hospital, mm -hmm. isn't it? Same role there. So our acute liaison nurses do the same within the hospital, help the hospital yeah. staff. So the next is about collaboration, isn't it? So the critical things to help reduce health inequalities for people with learned disabilities from a GP. Mm. What are the things you get from a GP surgery? Um, lots. <laughs> no, once a year. What do well, you get? From... Annual health check. Yes, yes annual right. health check. <laughs> Sorry, put yeah. you on the spot there. Yeah. So you get an annual health check. So why is that so important? Annual health checks are important because it's like once a year you get to speak with a doctor about your health mm. and, you know, you, you go and you make an action plan and it could be about losing weight, it could be about, you know, coming up with things you might need to do. So it might be about maybe having a blood test that year at some point. It might be about having, um, you know, do it, you know, having your eyes checked and things so going it's top to, to toe. So it? yeah, it's top to toe. Top to toe. You talk about everything, check. about everything from head to, to toes. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's a really important. Um, yeah. So if we look at how we can all work together from people from all health services, it's about us not siloing off, isn't it? So even if it's a health professional who's seeing someone for leg ulcers, mm -hmm. they can still say, "Oh, do you have an annual health check? Have you had your flu jab?" Have you had your COVID jab? Oh, make sure you speak to your doctor because they're really important. Yes. You know, it's about us keeping that momentum up together and mm. all seeing health as a holistic thing. And obviously on our website, we have loads of tools as well, isn't it? So yes. It's, it's about knowing those and saying, oh, you should keep an eye on these tools. So, for example, we have the Know Your We tool, don't we, yep. on there? Now, again, this is about help getting people with learning disabilities to know so you wouldn't have known before what was a healthy color we no. are not till this chart yeah and we had yeah. that guy who's yes. got severe autism yeah. and his carers put this up in the toilet um because he locks the door and he won't let anyone see anything that goes on in the bathroom yeah non-verbal and he pulled the staff in the next day and pointed to this number eight 
Now he's now on the bladder cancer treatment pathway. Yeah. There's no way that would have been diagnosed if he if, if he did. hadn't had this charter. No. So if all health professionals in all areas just said, have you had your own health check? It's really important. Do you use the tools on the website? It's really important. That could be the difference between mm. that person getting saved from having bladder cancer and not, even though they've seen them for leg ulcers. Yeah. So, so that's what we'd like to see, is that full collaboration of everyone seeing healthcare for people with learning disabilities as a whole thing. Whatever you've yeah. seen them for, share the lot. Um, I think that's really critical. I think the final one, Gavin, let me just check whether it's the final thing we wanted to talk about. Yeah, the final thing is around safeguarding, because again, yeah. this is holistic. And I'd love yeah. you to end by sharing, you know, why it's so important for yeah. everyone to think safeguarding. So I I had a phone call once um, and they said that I'd won a holiday and I really believed it. I made, you know, they said that I'd won a holiday to Barbados as well as um, seven thousand pounds to spend on this holiday yeah. and i really took it seriously and it was only when my carer came in so no photo oh, yes. so they said that yeah and then they asked you for your bank details yes, they did, yes. to transfer the seven thousand spending money yeah, to you didn't that's they? right yes yes so, you've got your bank card out yeah yeah merrily sharing all your private information. Yeah, so I had my bank card out. My carer came in, saw me with my bank card and asked me what I was doing. I said I won a holiday and she quickly took the phone off and put the phone down on me. Obviously, I was a little bit upset, you know, <laughs> with her and things, but she then explained to me and things. So, and, you know, I wonder if I went to a doctor or a nurse and said, oh, I won a holiday the other day and I gave out my bank information. Would they just say, oh, that's nice? Yes. Or would their alarm bells go... Mm, that doesn't yeah. sound right, isn't it? It's about those alarm bells it's going those on. Those alarm bells, yeah. Yeah. Very quickly, just to end, tell the story of the person who thought he was dating Madonna. Yes. Yeah, so there was this chap who um, he went to the doctors to talk about um, about uh, he met he met this girl and he wanted to talk about um, contraception, and he went into the doctors. And they were speaking about it. First time ever he'd spoken to this patient about this. So just out of conversation, he just said, oh, so, you know, it's great. You've got a girlfriend now and it's great that you come to me today to ask about this. Just, you know, tell me a bit about her. And he said, oh, she's lovely. She's um, she's a she's she's a singer and she's called Madonna. And um, the doctor went, right, OK, OK. So like the like the singer Madonna. And he said, no, it is the singer Madonna. Well, of course, the doctor then thought this is not quite right, wanted to make sure that, you know, this chap wasn't hallucinating or anything. So went to, rang up social services, spoke to the social services. Social services were aware that he'd been speaking to some girl but didn't know about yeah. the Madonna bit. So then they... They, they acted on it they fast. They acted on it they? fast. Yeah. And it turned out that this chap was actually going to Heathrow Airport with £5,000... Of his money. Of his money to... And then there were some men were intercepted, There were some men intercepted at the yeah, airport. Yeah. So, again, that doctor fortunately used the safeguarding helpline and it's about any morsel of information may be that final morsel that enables that to happen. So it's about everyone, again, collaborative. If it sounds dodgy, then it probably is dodgy. Mm. And if it's not, you've done no harm by sharing it. And if it is you could have actually saved a life, yeah. isn't it? So, yeah, so that's really all. Saved a financial situation or anything, we yeah. don't know. So, okay, so that's the final part of help, I think. I think, you know, as a roundup, it really is just about everybody thinking holistically and ensuring they've dotted the I's, they've crossed the T's, they've thought outside the box, as you say, and they've really tried to enable the same outcomes for the person with a learning disability or an autistic person as they would for anyone else. Yeah. So we're about to go to your final pledge. Once you've gone through that final talk about and pledge list, then it's time to look as a service and individuals how you're going to compile that and make something that you can regularly review. Now we all know that we've got very busy working lives and with the best will in the world, Sometimes our learning from training just falls off the radar. So it's really key when you've made that final list 
that you make a process where you regularly review it in order to maintain and become that service of excellence that bridges health inequality gaps for people with learning disabilities and autistic people. Thank you. Time to talk and make a pledge for what you as individuals or as a team can do to make reasonable adjustments for people with learning disabilities and autistic people. Final pledge, and this one focuses on the health. So what can you do around mental capacity and best interest and how you use that in your everyday processes to reduce delays in diagnosis? How can you seek the help of others and their advice? What can you do about collecting and using feedback to adapt and shape your service? Do you use the purple folder? And if not, other health passports if you're not in Hertfordshire. Can you start a practice of asking to see a Me On My Best Day video and encouraging people to record one if they don't have one? Do you utilise the Learning Disability Nursing Service to bridge but not fill the gap for health inequalities? Over to you.